Once again, another mentoring tip. A mentor does not always have to be somebody older. Brian was one year under me. I was the captain of the team. I went to Brian and Brian, I couldn't cover him. I'd line up 10 yards off of him, he would run by me. So I went to Brian after I read this, I said, Brian, can you help me get faster? This is when I learned the power of the transference of belief. Meaning, you cannot believe something, but if somebody believes it more convincingly, they can literally transfer what they believe to you. So I went to Brian like I'm looking at you. I said, Brian, can you help me get faster? He looks at me to kill. He says, Aeneas, you can run a 4340. I said, what? 4340, right? I said, what do I do? Let's go behind the mask. Yo, man, welcome back to another edition, Super Bowl edition. We have another special guest, too. Absolutely. Let's give it up for my man, Aeneas Williams. <sighs> Is in the building. In the house. Glad to be here, Tekel. And is that is that the pronounced way, the correct way? You did say it right, Tekel. It's Tekel. It's Tekel. Tekel, like yeah. an E. Yeah. Tekel. Yeah. I'm from New Orleans, so we got to work on that dialect. Man. <laughs> Marshall Falk and I, believe it or not, we we had to learn how to get the New Orleans out of us because mm -hmm. we knew we wanted to properly influence people. Right. Everybody not from New Orleans, so I have to make sure I know how to pronounce it so we can uh, influence the world instead of just the city of New Orleans. Glad to be here with you guys. See, I appreciate that, man. And, and we know you're a busy guy, man, but... Productive. You know, productive. Ah, I like that. Big I like difference. That. Like productive. That. Big, productive. This productive. And you know what else was productive, too? Your football career. Eight-time Pro Bowler. Five-time All-Pro. Uh, NFL 1990s All-Decade Team. You accomplished all of that, won a Super Bowl with the St. Louis Rams on their 10th anniversary team, and uh, the Bart Starr Award in 2000, man. Mm -hmm. So when you put together all of this and we look at the festivities that's going around in Super Bowl, I know it's not by accident, but taking a glimpse back at everything that you mm -hmm. went through in order to accomplish all of the titles or the accolades that you won, like. What did, looking back, what did it take to get all of that? What, what one thing was the common thing to wow. help you get through all of that? Well, first, all due respect to Tom Brady, I lost to Tom Brady yeah. in his first Super Bowl, mm -hmm. so we didn't win it. But I appeared in the Super Bowl in New Orleans. Um, Tequila, it starts at home. Um, dad and mom, I never had two older brothers growing up in New Orleans. I grew up in Holly Grove, same area, Lil Wayne, all of us from the same area. Uh, Birdman, Brian Williams, we went to junior high school together. But man, with dad and mom, my two older brothers, I never had to look outside the house for a role model. I mean, literally. And my dad's first college graduate on both sides of the family. He graduated from the Southern University. We said off camera, we just putting this out that TKL would have been the first pick in the draft <laughs> had he gone to the Southern University. You know? No disrespect to Auburn, all right? War <laughs> Eagles, much love. But it really started there. And I learned my dad, think about this, guys. So my dad is the youngest of, uh, of nine siblings. Hopefully I get through this without crying. Because I think your podcast uh, and the title of it, Behind the Mask, is huge. Uh, even now seeing Kobe pass, and I didn't know him. And the reason why I'm bringing it up now, because a lot of times the question you're asking me, there are a lot of people thinking what we do uh, is because we're different from them. Right. And we're not. So my dad, the youngest of nine siblings, his four brothers, the oldest brother died sclerosis of the liver, drug addict. The second brother was shot and killed while sitting at a bar. Uh, the third brother was a millionaire. Uh, selling, uh, was a distributor of uh, heroin, sent us to Angola for life. I was fortunate to get him out a year before he passed. And then his Ford brother died homeless. And when my dad began to assess what problem, what were some of the challenges of the boys? And by the way, his four sisters, one just passed away, it's just my dad and now three sisters left. And when he started assessing, I guess before he had boys, there's some things you learn with, with your parents and you're fortunate He's, they're still around, I can still ask questions. And, and I'll tell you about something I learned about three years ago from my dad. 
And um, he, he thought his, his dad was too soft on the boys. So um, and I have this passion because we don't know who's going to see this, right? Right. And, um, and, he was, and they were disciplinarians. I wouldn't be here if, uh, without his accountability. And um, so the vision was never sports. The vision, he knew education made the difference. And he's changed the trajectory of our family when it comes down to education. So uh, I started playing football when I was uh, four years old. Harrell Park, Ed Reed, Odell Beckham Jr., um, Leonard Fournette, all of them came out the same park, Harrell. Uh, last time the Super Bowl was played in New Orleans was the Ravens and the 49ers, ironically. And that field that was in the dome is now at my park, Harrell Park, where I grew up. Mm. I was with uh, Luke last night here in Miami and the work that he's doing in these, with youth football, right? Mm. So I got a chance to talk to him last night. And man, it was, it was eerie. I said, Luke, how did you do this? He's been doing this over 30 years. I said, you in a rap business? He, I said, how'd you end up building this? Because they had uh, 707 games, both men and women, young people playing ball out there. I said, how'd you do this? And he said, well, once, once I went in, I, I got involved in my business and um, I ended up in court because of the music and he learned politics. And he said he realized how important politics was to influence in the community. So he said first he, he began to use sports to, to be a safe haven for the, the youngsters in the community. And then when all these people started gathering around to see these games, he realized this is a voting base. So he, I said, so how did you reach the people that were standing around, the parents, the friends, the uncles, the, the, the homies? He said, I would stop the game and begin to share with them how important it is to get involved in a voting process. Wow. So I said, how did you keep the games from coming in the park? And this is when it came back full circle, back to New Orleans. He said, the gangs all know these are, their, these are their nephews, these are their sons. This is the safe haven. None of it comes here. Then all of a sudden, I remember Coach Mims back at Harrell Park. Harrell Park was a safe haven. All things happened around there, but you could not bring it in the park, right? So now, all of a sudden, now my dad, this stuff coming full of circles. There, there are things and so many dangers in our lives and things in our communities that for us is normal. For other people, it's like it happens and they move out. <laughs> yeah. And it's like the stuff you see you think is normal until you get in other environments and realize, man, it's not normal. So going back to dad and mom, um, I learned the fear of man. Like I never forget my dad got the three boys together. He said, if you guys ever have to choose between me and the police, choose the police, right? <laughs> so when your dad get his bluff in early, you just learn. Um, that respect and that respect outside the house. So that was the, the foundation, TKO. That was the foundation that, and I didn't get recruited coming out of high school, even though I was on a very good team. I wasn't the most talented. So once I didn't get recruited, hey, I'm going to Southern. My middle brother was there, who was really my idol, 18 months older. And I just went and got involved in, um, in education. And um, but go on. And you only played what two years at Southern, right? I played three. Three years at Southern. So did you start? You started all three years at Southern. So I end up giving my life to Jesus Christ my junior in college. Prior to that, me and my two older brothers, a lady would come in the neighborhood when we were growing up and pick up all these kids, take us to church. Never made any sense. It was crazy to me. The people didn't even like us uh, who were there because they couldn't understand why this lady was going around picking up these bad kids. And we would go. Never made sense. I didn't think God was real. I, I, I thought God was like you send six days, empty your sin bucket on the seventh Seven day, day, then go back out. I said, God, if you're real, 
show me how you relate to us in everyday life. I gave my life to Christ. A couple of things he taught me immediately. One, the nature of purpose. Everything around us has a purpose, including humans. And whatever we're purposed to do, we're already inherently gifted with it. But we have to do something to get the max out of it. That was the first thing, purpose. Second thing was how to hear God. I would hear, growing up, I would hear people say, I heard God. I was standing next to him, I hear nothing. So I learned that he speaks to your heart. It says when Moses turned 40 years old, it entered in his, into his heart to go visit his brother. David did all was in his heart unless God told him differently. So all of a sudden, to kill, a week before the season starts, my junior year in college, it enters my heart to walk on a team. It made no sense because I'm on pace to graduate with my accounting degree in three years because I was going year-round summer school. I just followed my heart, didn't tell my boys, nobody knew. Didn't tell my parents because I was on their dime. I was the last kid they were, they were, they were going to have to pay for it. So I went and walked on. These guys had already been going through three a days. We did, they were doing three a three days. days. Yeah, I remember yeah, it was that crazy, one. right? You know. Not even legal anymore, right, right? right? And I asked the coach if I can walk on. He allowed me to walk on. Ended up starting by the fifth game. And then I played the next year. I was a, I was a rover back my first year, just get to the ball. Second year, play corner, all conference, led the conference interception, starter. And then played my last year, which was my third year, while in graduate school. And after the second year, I had a good year. We had upset Gramlin, and that's right, all of you Gramlin nights, Southern. We beat <laughs> Gramlin <laughs> in the dome. And in the Times Picayune, which is the New Orleans newspaper, my coach who allowed me to walk on, he had, he made a, he had a quote in the paper because I had a decent game in a Bayou Classic. He says, Aeneas Williams is a good player, but I don't think he'll ever go pro because at best he runs a 4-640. Wow. Which a number of people hear that and they begin to build their whole life to prove this coach wrong, right? Or prove people wrong. No, when I heard that, that gave me direction. Because number one, he was fairly right. I was running a 4-6. But that's when I began to learn the difference between facts and truth. The facts were I ran a 4-6. The truth was I had the ability to run a 4-2-8. So as I tell you that story, I came back, and this goes back, I was asking the young people about mentorship, right? Mm -hmm. Earlier before we got on. So I went to my teammate after I read that. So we were finishing up the fall. Bayou Classic is always Thanksgiving weekend, that Saturday after Thanksgiving. We went back to school to finish up before the, the, the Christmas and New Year's break. Soon as I got back in the dorm with my teammate, I went to a guy by the name of Brian Thomas. Brian Thomas was the fastest guy on Southern's track team and the fastest guy on the football team. You went to the source. I went to a credible, successful other who was doing well what I was hoping to do. Now, already in my mind, I've been taught Either you have speed when you grow up, they teach you, particularly when you're in sports, you got fast guys. In my mind, I was taught early on, either you got speed or you don't. You can't coach it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what you're thinking, even as I go to Brian. So this guy named Brian, he was like our Usain Bolt. Brian was a 4'2", 40 guy, 6'2", wide receiver, 10 second 100 meters. Mm -hmm. He was one year be uh, below me. Once again, another mentoring tip. A mentor does not always have to be somebody older. Brian was one year under me. I was the captain of the team. I went to Brian, and Brian, I couldn't cover him. I'd line up 10 yards off of him. He would run by me. So I went to Brian. After I read this, I said, Brian, can you help me get faster? This is when I learned the power of the transference of belief, meaning you cannot believe something but if somebody believes it more convincingly, they can literally transfer what they believe to you. So I went to Brian like I'm looking at you. I said, Brian, can you help me get faster? He looks at me to kill. He says, Aeneas, you can run a 4340. I said, what? 4340, right? I said, what do I do? He said, next spring when we come back, he said, one, he's from, Brian was from New Orleans as well. He said, when I go home, I'm working out with my high school coach. I said, 
I want you to come work out with me. I said, what do I do? He said, get next to me and do everything I do. I said, get next to you and do everything I do. I did. Then I said, he said, next spring, walk on the track team. I said, walk on the track team? I said, man, I'm in graduate school. I'm already finished. He said, you walked on the football team? I said, well, you got a point, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I walk on the track team, and my teammates, I didn't know this, my teammates on the football team, they were watching us. Like they were, they were, they told me later on, they want me to do a movie about this. My teammates, a lot, lawyers, a bunch of them, they were watching this transformation. Like this is, this is a, this to them is a miracle. Because I literally couldn't run. I was afraid, they certainly didn't think I'd play in the league. So all this unbelievable stuff that's in my head, but in my heart is something different. So I walk on and and I'm with Brian and we're on the track, we'll run a quarter, one, one lap around. We start off the first 10 yards, I'm with him, and then he'd leave me. And I mean, he'd be, and, but he'll be, when he finished the line, he'd come on, Niels, come on. Man, we finished the workout, one of the workouts, I'm on the ground, and I'm looking at Brian. Brian is walking like he hadn't run. Like, I'm on the ground, I've never experienced this. And finally, my leg said to me, while I'm looking at Brian, my leg said to me, he said, Niels, you can keep this up, but we out. That's my leg <laughs> <show me." laughs> No, sir, this true story, man. <laughs> and, and so this January, by April, pro day, which is about third week of April, Brian Thomas and I were the fastest two on Southern's track team. I clocked the 428 in April. After that, I was the second rated cornerback in the country behind Todd Light out of Notre Dame. Yep, which eventually became your teammate later in, in your career. We never played. I replaced Todd. Ah. Todd ended up leaving, and then I came uh, to the Rams to after the Rams. Todd left. But it goes back to that mentorship purpose. So let's go back to hearing that voice. So many people hear things, but they never pursue it. Because they hear it, and then they try to run it through their head. If I had heard it and then been thinking, man, these guys already been practicing through the day. This crazy. This don't make sense. If I told my parents, my, I don't know what my parents would have said. They may have said, hey, you getting ready, we're getting ready to pay this last tuition. You saved that pipe dream. I didn't tell my boys because it made no sense. We would go to the games. And at HBCUs, you go to games at halftime. So it's just all those things when you ask me these questions, man, is I this ooze out of me because it was in my Hall of Fame speech. At the end of the day, I had two things I wanted people to remember from the Hall of Fame speech. Begin with the end in mind and die empty. In other words, figure out what you want at the beginning. Yeah. Right? And then once you know, get a snapshot of what you want, literally we've been created in such a way to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so when I sit here and you, you know, once again, you guys talk about behind the mask, mm -hmm. This is the story, this is my story, but a number of us have these stories. I just want people to know it's possible for you. It may not be NFL, right, as you guys know. It's whatever. We're all Hall of Famers in some areas. You know, he got a baritone voice, man. Yeah. He got a Hall of Fame baritone bo voice, right? Man, don't tell that dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Keep, keep going, keep going. Right. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> I got Todd who produces uh, the the, podcast, the Legends podcast that we do. Phenomenal, right? Just, I love to see how all of us in our roles and in the, next, the younger generation, social media and all those things get them looking at everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Instead of realizing, man, you, you your own, I call it Insta face, right? Instagram. You your own. Like, you're, you become unique when you embrace who you are. And I didn't even tell you, the reason I was in accounting, I have a degree in accounting. I don't even like numbers. I was so just how following. Do, how, do you, how do you not like numbers, but you get a degree in accounting? I'm following my brother, Achilles. He's my model. Achilles, mm. my brother, used to fight me from following him. He literally, so once I got to Southern, I was in an apartment with him as a freshman. So I wasn't thinking about football. Achilles, student government vice president. He pledged a fraternity. He's in accounting. He's a numbers guy all the way from elementary. So what, I, what I'm learning and why I brought that up is 
You literally follow somebody who's a good model, but you can model your way into a destiny that's not yours. Mm -hmm. So he graduated in three and a half years because once again, we were going year round. So after he got a, a, a job with Price Waterhouse, I'll never forget, he told me, he called me back, he said, little brother, slow down, you're going to be working the rest of your life. And that's when his epiphanous relationship with Christ set in, that's when purpose set in, that's when I began to attempt to find out who in the world is it is. Because up until that time, I was Achilles' little brother. And the crazy thing, because of the model, my parents, their work ethic, I would have been a great accountant. I just would have been miserable. Mm-hmm. And that's what, so, so those type things, the, to, the ability to be true to oneself. Because nobody knows you but you. Like, I, I, I could have had a, a, C, a, a accounting degree. My brother's a CPA. He's the, he's the CFO of the Baton Rouge Chamber of Commerce. This dude loved numbers. Give him a desk and a calculator. He stayed there for 12 hours. Watch him work. Right. Give me a desk and a calculator. I'm turning it over. <laughs> right, but I want I my part of my passion is to communicate effectively, take complicated things and make it simple. That's why one of the reasons I pastor my wife and I, the Spirit Church St. Louis, is because the gospel changed me so much, the relevance of it and the practicality of it. And when God touched my heart to pastor, it was never for people to serve me, but to serve the people to understand that this is not a religious book. These are laws and principles and how to live successfully on the earth. And the scripture tell you what caused people to be successful and what caused them to have challenges. So I, I had a passion, and I have a passion through, through the ministry, but also in just in the things that we do to help bring a, a realness to us. Because everybody knows who they are behind the mask. <laughs> everybody, yeah. right? But we don't always know because we got masks on, and particularly men, yeah. right? So they're just, and, and that's the part of the story, but man, that goes through suffering. Mm. I think you mentioned this earlier. Right. Like, you go through things, right? You doubt yourself. You go yeah. through stuff, you know, you, you, you try to, especially at a young age when you try to find yourself. And, and, and for me, when I hear you talk about the Spirit Church, you talk about the power or the influence or, 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 or just how important it is when it comes to mentorship being able to reach back out into the community. We know what happened in Ferguson mm -hmm. a few years ago. You took it upon yourself and your wife to embed yourself into that community yes. mm -hmm. and to be that voice of reasoning. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the ministry of Christ is reconciliation. The more you read the Bible, the more you love people. Anybody that reads it and gets any other thing out of it is misguided. You're fascinated how much God loves people. And a shade of their color has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. So people have dignity. I learned from Christ, people have dignity even if they don't know it. And I'm to apply that level of respect to them even if they don't know it. So the ministry of reconciliation simply means if you got two opposing groups on separate sides of the street, Walk down the center and figure out ways to connect them because we're better together. What made this country so great such a short period of time is because it's called the United States. What is our big challenge now? People are no longer listening at the table. They're taking sides at the table. Whereas before, if you put a diamond, here's the other thing I learned from, from understanding. If you put a diamond on this table and you set a bunch of us around that table, everybody would see the diamond from a different angle. And each angle would be right or true to what you see. Because it's their perspective. It's their perspective. They're... So I had to learn to listen. Like to listen. Even to my children, I'm learning better to listen, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not all the answers. The, they, they say the millennials or Generation Z. I need to learn to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. The world, the world has changed. A big part of their phones is a, is a part of their lives, right? Well, guess what? A big part of my life is my phone. So I had, I have to, we have to learn. Here's the other thing. About three or four Olympics ago, the United States men and women uh, four by one track teams, both of the, in that Olympic, they were each predicted to win the gold medal. But both the men and women dropped the baton and were disqualified. When I saw that, I began to research to find out who bears the greatest responsibility for a successful exchange in a relay. 
To my surprise, I always thought it was the person receiving. Turn out it's the person handing off. They're not to let the baton go until it's safely in tow. The older generation, sometimes they look at the younger generation and say, can't relate to them, right? Yeah. They different, the millennials and all of that. But the truth is, we got to figure out a way, adapt how we communicate to put the baton in their hands. Because when we get older, they're going to be have their hands on the nuclear buttons. They're going to be in the rooms making decisions about your social insecurity, yeah, <laughs> right? right? They're going to make these decisions. So it's our responsibility to figure out how do we make the decisions so these things will be around for them and for our grandchildren. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Behind the Mask podcast. Indulge, share, and subscribe to quality content and we're everywhere we're on youtube make sure you scroll to the bottom click that little bell for notifications we're on google play we're on spotify and we're on apple music even on social media we're gonna make it easy for you follow at the btm podcast for your weekly fixings and remember there's only one rule there are no rules let's, let's go, go behind, behind the, the mask, mask.